Once again, we're so glad you're here. If you have a copy of God's Word, would you take it and turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians? 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. We're so, so glad you joined us on a nice, hot, balmy Sunday morning like last Sunday morning. A little colder than it was last Sunday. Oh, the, the, the statement is so true. Did not like the weather one week in South Mississippi? It'll change the next week. So I'm so glad you're here this morning. If you're joining us online, we're really glad you're with us as well. Uh, I told the 830 service there are some that probably were jealous because somebody probably decided like what my wife threatened to do this morning, which was stay in her pajamas and stay in bed this morning because it was too cold. So uh, if you happen to be one of those, we're glad you're able to join us online. Uh, there are some ways you can connect with us this morning. Go to our resources tab on our website, pedalfbc.com slash resources. You can find uh, the sermon notes there, the on-purpose stuff we're going to talk about in just a moment, as well as you can download our app. You can find all that information there on our Pedal FBC app. As well. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. I'm looking forward to March the 7th, by the way, uh, as we get ready to kind of gear back into some sort of uh, regular kind of schedule. It's a little bit different than what we had pre COVID, obviously, because we feel called to continue to do two worship services so we can still have distance and space. If we put the first service in with this one, we'd be completely full. And we still feel like we want to still be able to allow folks to socially distance. So we'll be doing that in life groups. So we're going to adjust our schedule a little bit, 15 minutes either side. So a little bit later for the 1030 service. For, so for late sleepers, hallelujah for you. We announced Wednesday night for our early birds at 830, 815. There were some of this right here. There's not a chance. I'm better to make it 830. So they'll probably join us at the 1030. So if you like to do it a little bit earlier, want to come at 815, there's a lot more room to spread out. You can do that at 815. Life groups will be from 930 to 1030. And I want to encourage you, one of our concerns has always been as a season we roll back in, we want to get everyone back in life groups. If you've not been in one, uh, on that Sunday morning, we'll have folks scattered throughout the building. Uh, we'll help head that up and we'll have folks to help you get to a life group. You can email him, find out more information. We want you connected to a life group for you, for your children, for your students. We'll be spread out literally all over the building and be a part of small groups together. So we're looking forward uh, to that. Well, reminder, just to quickly also, that we are in this season of on purpose. We began this a couple of weeks ago. You've got the third uh, handout there on your chair. I hope you'll take it with you. It's got the prayer guide on it. Of course, it's online on our website as well as on our social media, but we want you to have that in front of you so you can continue to do those five C's we talked about. So you're living your spiritual journey on purpose, not haphazardly kind of just randomly turning to the Bible and reading a ver verse that says, and Jesus swept and wondering what that means, but actually give you the intentionality of how you might read and, and get the most out of your reading of God's word and praying together. So remember, we talk about the five C's. We talked about centering on scripture, reading the book of Colossians together as a church family in the month of February. We're challenging you to create a here journal that has those, that acronym of the word here, which is highlight, examine, apply, and respond. We want you to do the third thing to concentrate on 28 days of prayer. We give you some guidelines how you might pray alongside that scripture that goes with it. We want you then to choose to memorize a verse, Colossians 3.12. It's out of the NIRV, which is what our kiddos use on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. But it, it's got that verse we want to challenge you to memorize. It's a great verse out of Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. And then lastly, carve out time for spiritual conversations with your family. We're challenging every family to have at least one. Now, we'd love to see you have way more than that, but at least one. We give you a couple of questions that you might ask of your children, of your teenagers. You might have to make it work if they're younger, right? And you've got the God times things that also go along with some of these things as well you can use with your kiddos, especially if they're preschoolers. So we want to help encourage you that you are the primary disciple of your children. And you want to encourage them in their reading of God's Word and praying together and having these spiritual conversations. We're excited about what God's going to continue to do. 
Now this morning we're going to pick back up in, in our second message in this series, Unshaken in Uncertain Times. Unshaken in uncertain times. It seems to me that almost every time we uh, turn around, there is something new happening, something different is occurring. There continues to be turmoil and uncertainty in our world. And yet, as followers of Christ, we're called to live an unshaken life. We might ask, how do you do that in the times that are difficult and hard and often uncertain? But yet, what we've discovered that really our calling more than ever, especially in uncertain times, is that we would display as a follower of Jesus that, in fact, we can live an unshaken life. Not because of who we are, but because of who we stand on and who it is that lives inside of our lives if we're followers of Jesus. We talked about the first one last week about being contagious with our faith. Being contagious. We talked about this series. It's not so much about what you do. It's who you are. It's who you are becoming in Christ. And one of the ways that we can live unshaken as we stand firm on our faith is to, in fact, be contagious, to allow our faith to be on display to others. More than ever, people need to see people that are unshaken. Right? They would look at your life and say, well, aren't you bothered? Aren't you worried? Aren't you afraid of all that you see? And your answer would be very humbly and kindly, no, it's not. My life is unshaken. Do, do those things cause me concern? Well, sure they do. They're things that bother me and, and even may, at times even have a season to kind of be afraid. But when I come back down to the end of it, though, I find and discover that if I will base my life on God's word and on him, that in fact, I can be unshaken. And when we do that and when we live and walk that way, then our lives become a testimony. Our lives become a witness to those around us, right? To those around us that we are unshaken. We're not perfect. We have broken places in our lives. We all struggle in life. But I, at the end of the day, am unshaken because of who Christ Jesus is. We can be unshaken. The second one we're going to talk about this morning is this, is being authentic. Being authentic. This is an important word, and I pray that when we listen and hear and ask the question, are you living an authentic life? Are you living an authentic Christian life? And we're going to narrow it down even further to say, are you living a, a, as a leader? Are you living an authentic, godly life? Are you an authentic leader? Now, before so you say that, well, I don't know if I'm really a leader. I'm, I'm not really leading anybody. But here's the reality. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are a leader. You lead someone, even if you don't know it. You're leading someone closer to Christ or someone away from Christ. The question is, what kind of life are we living? Is it authentic? You know, what does it mean to be authentic? Well, let's look at two dic dictionary definitions to kind of talk about this for a moment, and then we'll dive into God's Word to see what it means to be authentic. This is beautiful. Authentic, from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, says this way, worthy of acceptance or belief, as conforming to or based on fact, conforming to an original, so as to reproduce essential features, made or done the same way as an original. It's not false or an imitation. It's real, actual, true to one's own personality, spirit, or character. One other definition from dictionary.com says it this way, authentic is not false or copied, it's genuine and real, having an origin supported by unquestionable evidence. Well, hang on to that one for a moment. Authenticated, verified, representing one's true nature or beliefs, true to oneself or to the person identified. Entitled to acceptance or belief because of agreement with known facts or experience, reliable or trustworthy. So here's my question I want to ask you. Is your life representing one's true nature or beliefs? Is your life supported by, that you're a follower of Jesus, by unquestionable evidence? Are you and I on authentic follower of Jesus? And even further, are we an authentic leader? For in these verses in chapter 2, the apostle Paul is talking about himself and Silas and Timothy and the kind of leaders that they were in the church at Thessalonica. The question is, are we those kinds of people? So no matter where you are this morning, God has a word for us. Let's read together chapter 2, verse 1. I'm going to pray together and then we'll dive into 10 things that it takes up to be a person who is an authentic leader. Verse number one says this, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. 
But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not as pleasing men, but to God who examines our hearts. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor do we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostle of Christ, we might have asserted our authority. But we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having thus a fond affection for you, we were pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you have become very dear to us. For you recall, brethren, our labor and our hardship, how working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave toward you believers, just as now, uh, just as you know how we were exhorting, encouraging, and imploring each one of you, as a father would his own children, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Father, I pray this morning by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would speak to our hearts and our lives. Lord, that you would encourage us, you would challenge us, you would transform us. God, we would be different for being in this place, meeting with you, with other followers of Jesus Christ. That God, you would do that work in us and through us. Lord, that you would allow the Holy Spirit to examine our hearts and really ask the question, am I living an authentic Christian life? It's who I am on Sundays match up who I am on Mondays, Tuesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. And God, in the areas that you would call us, that you would find us short, that we would confess those areas. We would repent and turn and become more like you. Lord, for those who may not know you yet this morning, that you would speak to their hearts this morning, for they cannot be authentic for something they've never yet experienced or tasted. And I pray they would see today that you are good and that you love them and desire to have a relationship with them. So God, speak to our hearts, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. If you have an outline, if you'll grab that, it's in the seat beside you, hopefully somewhere. You can grab one of those this morning as we dive into these 10 thoughts this morning. First, and briefly, number one, we see this. Godly, authentic leaders, or who are authentic and live an unshaken life. Number one, notice this, they have a right view of the past. If I'm going to live an authentic life, if I'm going to walk with the Lord and be a leader that God would have me to be, then I need to have a right view of the past. How I look backwards and see the things that have happened in my life and what it is that God has done in my life. The Apostle Paul was looking backwards to his time in Thessalonica. And we all know when we look backwards, we tend to have 20-20 vision. We tend to see things a little bit differently. We can see things better because they've already happened. Like God sees them before they happen, but we only see them afterwards. And if I'm with the kind of leader God wants me to be that's authentic, then I'm able to look backwards and see, you know what? I can see God's hand at work. It was a difficult season for the Apostle Paul in Thessalonica. He came to a town, a city where he was only able to stay three weeks and a riot ensued and and followers of Jesus were drug out into the streets and and there was a riot and there was just chaos. They eventually had to leave the city because of the chaos that had ensued. Not only that, you look back to where they were in Philippi, we see in verse number two where there had been a riot breakout there. In fact, they had been beaten, they had been whipped and put in stocks and chains. And we need about the story, the Philippian jailer, right? If you remember back in the book of Philippians or Back in the book of Acts, we see that, that this Philippian janitor was saved because God miraculously delivers them from the prison which they were singing in the midnight hour. Here's what they realized. What happened in the past, though, was difficult and hard. It was hard to walk through it. I want you to know, Thessalonians, it was not in vain. Listen, I'm going to be a leader. I've got to know that as I look past, no matter what somebody else may or may not do, if I did what God called me to do and I invested and I poured out my life and I was an authentic follower of Jesus, then guess what? It's not in vain. Sometimes we get weary and discouraged and frustrated and aggravated and wonder why I did I do this or why did I live this way and was it really worth it? Paul would say to you and I this morning, listen to me carefully, it is not in vain. 
Paul was maybe reminding himself because certainly there were times of discouragement in his own life for Paul was not perfect. Paul was never not discouraged. In fact, he had to be discouraged at seasons. We find that we have to have a right view of the past. Secondly, if I'm going to be an authentic leader, I've got to be confident in God's power. I've got to be confident in God's power, not in my power, not in my strength, not in my courage, and not in my boldness. If I attempt to do anything for the Lord and I do it in my own strength, many times I'm going to fail and fall flat on my face. Maybe a time or two I might see some sort of success, but it will be nothing that lasts, nothing that has great significance. For you notice what it says in verse number two there. Notice what it says here. He says, you know, we had the boldness. And then we might even miss that other verse as we just kind of plow through the verse. But what do we see it says here? We had the boldness in our God to speak to you. They weren't bold of themselves. They weren't bold because they were well-educated. They weren't bold because they were Jewish. They weren't bold because they've been a follower of Christ a really, really long time. They were bold, what? In Christ Jesus. How we need people today to be bold in Christ Jesus, to be bold with the gospel, to be bold with sharing their faith. You see, an authentic leader, a follower of Jesus, is one who shares their faith in boldness, no matter the persecution, no matter the stress, no matter the trial that may come your way. Listen, here's the reality. I don't know about you, but if I'd have been the Apostle Paul, I think I would have kind of wanted to kind of like, kind of ease up on my bold factor because it didn't work out too well in Philippi. I got thrown in jail. I got beaten half to death. And here I am in Thessalonica. It's happening again. And he's going to go to the next city. And guess what happens? They're still saying the same message. And the same thing happens yet again. Most of us would be kind of like, well, listen, I don't want to offend anybody. Let me kind of tone down the rhetoric of the gospel. That's where we live in our world today. I'm afraid where so many of us are afraid or timid to share the gospel with boldness. But listen, folks, and I don't mean this that we go about celebrating this fact, but here is the truth. The gospel, Jesus says, in fact, is offensive. It is offensive for you and I to tell someone what the Word of God says and what somebody told you is that, in fact, you were a sinner in need of a Savior. You were lost and doomed and on a road to hell itself. You were the enemy of God, but thank God, in Christ Jesus, He came and saved your soul. Nobody would sign up and say, listen, I don't really need a word of encouragement. Just go ahead and tell me. Listen, you're a sorry sinner. Don't believe me? Go try it with one of your co-workers at work you know is lost as a goose. And go tell them and say, listen, I just want you to know that the Bible says you're lost. You're like, you're like a sinner. And they're going to say what? Oh, thank you for telling me. I've been wondering all this time that I, I just knew I was a sinner. They're going to say, I'm not a sinner. Who are you to call me a sinner? Sinner, they'd say back to you maybe. I'm not a sinner. I'm not a bad person. I don't do things. I'm not a murderer. I didn't, I'm not had an affair. I've not done this and I've done that. Right? I'm not a bad person. But the Bible says, without Christ, we are doomed. So what we need is our authentic followers of Jesus are those who are bold, not in themselves, not in their skill set, not in their talents, but bold in Christ Jesus. Thirdly, they're truthful. These leaders are truthful. They're authentic. Followers of Jesus are truthful. Paul says, we weren't deceitful when we came to you. We only shared the truth with you. We weren't trying to get something that wasn't ours. We weren't trying to act like we were religious charlatans, which were so many that were walking around this day and time. We were simply going to tell you the truth. One commentator says this, that Paul was the opposite of a false teacher. His message was truth. His life was pure. His ministry was honest without hypocrisy or deception. We must be truthful as leaders. Truthful in our lives and the truth that we present. Fourthly, we don't talk about leaders. They are generous. They are generous. Paul says we weren't greedy. We weren't trying to use you to get something. We weren't trying to teach you something like so many in the time with flattering speech and with a heart of greed trying to get something that even wasn't theirs. In other words, they weren't trying to suck up or kiss up to try to get something out of somebody. They were just simply generous people. They didn't use false flattery and words. They were people who were generous Fifth, and perhaps the crux in the middle part of this message, it helps us understand, and this is critical. 
If I'm going to be an authentic follower of Jesus Christ, I'm going to see a person who is a God pleaser and not a man pleaser. I don't want you to miss this point. This is so critical we understand this. In this day and age, more than ever before, it seems to me. Our culture would say, listen, you've got to make certain you make everybody happy in your life. You've got to make sure that people like you and think you're wonderful and cool and awesome. You've got to please everybody in your life. I want to challenge you with this truth. That is not what God's word says. If I'm going to be an authentic follower of Jesus Christ, I must lead by example and show and demonstrate that my goal, my aim, my purpose is not to please you. It's not to please my kids. It's not to please even my wife. It is to please God and God alone. But here's the kicker. When I please God and God alone, many times, most of the time, I'm going to please my wife and please my kids and please those around me. But make no mistake, friend, there will be seasons when pleasing God means you will displease men and it's okay. Is it easy? No. It's much easier to float downstream. It's much easier when somebody shoots at you or points at you and we want to kind of back up and say, well, let me kind of make you happy. That's not really what I meant. That's not really what I said. Listen, we must be certain that God is pleased with us before man is pleased with us. Sometimes both can happen simultaneously. We can please God and that pleases men, but there will be many times, and I'm afraid as we continue to go through this season of life and further towards the second coming of Jesus Christ, that in fact, we will more times than not displease men if we are pleasing God. Too often we're wired this way. We grew up this way. We need people to like us, to think we're great, to tell us how awesome we are. Right? We start as children and teenagers. We need that. We thrive off that. But guess what? So do a lot of adults. We never go out of teenage years of needing people to like us and affirm us and say that we're great and wonderful and awesome and what we're doing is great. So here's my question. Are you a man pleaser or a God pleaser? Are you a man pleaser or are you a God pleaser? Listen, here's the reality about pleasing men. He's, Paul was talking about, I've got to share the gospel. Paul understood, and so must we, that we've been entrusted with the greatest news the world has ever heard. But here's the problem. It's not the greatest news if people don't hear it in time. They've got to hear it from you and me. That there is a God who loves them, who wants to give them meaning and purpose in life. And so when they, they walk and drive down this road, they don't, they're wondering, why am I here? What am I here for? Some of them don't even, even think about it. And you can tell them because you know, many of you in this room, You know, and I know. And he says it will be approved by God. Paul's saying God would approve me. Why? Because he knows I'm pleasing him. And sixthly, authentic leaders use their authority in the right way. Listen, God's going to give you authority if you're leading people. You have authority. You have an opportunity to exercise influence on somebody else. Paul had that opportunity. Paul was saying to them, I could have come in and used my authority and I didn't have to work and you would have had to support me. But Paul says that's the exact opposite of what we did. We came in and we told and we worked hard so we could have the opportunity to share the gospel. Listen, if you're going to lead, it requires hard work. If you're going to lead, it might put a bullseye on your back. As a leader, we're not called to get to those positions so we can coast. We're called to those positions so we can lead and lead with authenticity. And lead in such a way that leaves an impact on those who are around us. And how do we do that? How did Paul do that? Paul was a servant. Why? Because he modeled the life of Jesus. Jesus was the greatest leader who's ever lived of all times. But even as a leader, he led his disciples, but oh, how he served them. He was not ashamed to reach down and wash the feet of his disciples. Dear friends, the authority that we might be given, we must use it in the right way. Not for our advantage, but to serve. Number seven, authentic leaders are those who are sensitive to others' needs. They're sensitive to others' needs. They are gentle, the Bible says here. And it says they talk about, they, they proved, they demonstrated with their life that they were gentle. This word here, gentle, means to be kind to someone, to, to accept, to respect, to be compassionate, tolerance of imperfections, to be patient, tenderhearted, 
and loyal. Here he gives the illustration of a nursing mother to a baby. It's appropriate. We're doing a baby dedication Sunday. We see the beautiful, wonderful picture of a mother's love and care and affection and compassion for her child, her needless, our needy, helpless child. Providing it warm, providing it the nutrients that it needs. Here Paul makes the example. That's what we're to be as followers of Jesus. Is to be gentle and nurturing and tenderly care for those who are around us. Number eight, we see if an authentic leader, a follower of Jesus Christ, what must we do? We must love deeply and sacrificially. We must love deeply and sacrificially. Folks, the reality, the truth is this, is that we by nature are selfish people. We want our way, our way, right away, all the time. Now, we like to say and hope that we're really not that way, but here's the reality. We really are. For ourselves, for our family, and everybody else kind of comes beyond that point, and there's certainly a point where we ought to do that. But here, Paul says, we came and we loved you with fond affection. This word only occurs here right in the New Testament, and it means here to, to long for someone passionately and earnestly. Again, link back to that mother's love for her newborn baby to express an affection so deep and compelling as to be unsurpassed. If I'm an authentic follower of Christ, I'm going to love people deeply with compassion and mercy. Listen, to love one another, we talked about last week, to love one another sometimes can be a challenge. Sometimes some of us, all of us, are hard to love sometimes. We'd like to think we're not. But guess what? We are to somebody. And he says here, we didn't just love you. We loved you with our lives. We shared our life with you. In other words, I didn't sing you some words, but I shared my life with you. One of the things I was, I'm drawn to, I grew up as a, as a young child at a church in, in Jackson. I love this pastor, one of the greatest pastors perhaps of the 20th century. But he seemed to be so perfect, I wondered if the man even knew how to spell sin. Because it never seemed it could have possibly happened to him. But as I came into an adult, I learned that how his children had such mighty struggles, how he had struggles and things that I never understood or knew. And so I committed, as when God had called me to ministry, I said, Lord, I don't ever want to present a picture to the people that I speak in front of and love on that my life is perfect. I cannot walk on water. I sin just like you. I struggle just like you. I struggle to be a good husband. I struggle to be a good dad sometimes. I struggle to be a good leader. So our words must match our walk. We've got to love people not just with our words, with our life. To impart our lives to them. Not just give them the gospel, for that is important. But we also give them our lives. We give part of ourselves away. Number nine, the last two quickly. They are people of integrity and honesty. They are people of integrity, which means, and he says, describes in verse number 10, they were honest, straightforward, and above reproach. In other words, Paul was saying, there's nothing anybody could say about what we did when we were among you. We loved you. We imparted the gospel to you. We were generous to you. We were truthful with you, right? All those things wrapped up in these three words he uses. He says, we were people, we were people, in fact, who showed what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. He gives an example of a father and a child. A father would show his child how to walk and how to live. Here's the great question to ask ourselves. What if someone followed you around every day this week? Or maybe every day last week, let's maybe put it that way. Would they be able to, as Paul talked about last week, as you have imitated Christ, could they imitate your life and find Jesus? Could they imitate your life and find what it means to be a Christ follower? Could your children imitate you and say, you know, I don't know what it means to follow Christ, but if I follow your example, I would know how to be a follower of Jesus. I would know how to live a life that is above reproach. Can people see in the way we live, our conduct, our habits, our our hobbies, our business, how we treat our kids, our spouse, our brothers or sisters, can they see who we are in Christ Jesus? Are we a leader whose walk matches his or her talk? 
Lastly, number 10, they encourage comfort and urge others to live a life that pleases God. Are you, with other believers, other people, encouraging them? Are you providing comfort when they need it as followers of Jesus? Because we all need it from time to time. And then are you urging others to live a life that pleases God? Takes us back to point number five, doesn't it? Paul's ultimate goal was to get to Thessalonians, and it's the goal that Christ has for us, is that we would live a life that pleases him. So let me ask you the question right now, is your life pleasing unto the Lord? If you were to stand right here in front of you and you would say, Lord, is my life pleasing you? What would he say? Now, don't, don't miss this because some of you would go, oh my goodness, God would be so displeased with me. God wouldn't even talk to me. God wouldn't even like me. I don't like me, so how could God like me? Listen, I got good news for you. The incredible grace and mercy of God. If God were to pull up a chair and go knee to knee, nose to nose, toe to toe with you and look you in the face, he would wrap his arms around you and say, I love you. You were already pleasing to me. And in that hug, in that embrace, he would say, but there are some things that are displeasing to me that we need to work on together. May we be leaders who encourage others, lift them up in a world of discouragement. May we be people who urge others to follow Christ, to hold them accountable, to love them enough to speak the truth to them in love and say, listen, I know you're over here, but God is really, I believe, based on what you told me, calling you over here. Or this part of your life doesn't even match up with what you say and how you're living. To encourage them, to comfort them, and to urge them to walk an authentic life as a follower of Jesus Christ. Are you a man pleaser or a God pleaser? If we could put up, and this would cause everybody, a lot of people have an anxiety attack, but if we could put everybody's life on the walls of this room, just start playing a video of our past week of everywhere we were, everything we thought, everything we did. <gasps> Right? Or you're online watching and we just kind of played a video screen of your life. Was it authentic? Was it genuine? Was it based off of evidence that would back up the truth that you're a follower of Jesus? If not, then my encouragement to you would be this as we close for an invitation. You would ask the Lord, Lord, what needs to change? So that I could be authentic and I could be unshaken and uncertain. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the truth of your word this morning. I thank you for the opportunity to stand before these. Father, I pray that you would use these words to speak through our hearts this morning. And I pray, Lord, as we come to a time of invitation, Lord, to consider, Lord, what you have done in our lives as we have sung to you. Lord, as we have listened to you, as we have dedicated children, as we have prayed to you this morning, and Lord, allow the word of God to speak truth into our lives. Lord, may this invitation song be the cry of our heart. For those that don't know Christ as Savior and Lord this morning, and we talk about being authentic, if they're really being real and genuine about where they are, they don't know you as Savior and Lord. Lord, they would have heard the offensive truth, Lord, that they're a sinner in need of a Savior. They are lost without you. But God, today they could be found. Today they could begin a relationship with you. And Father, give you all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And they would be able to say, Lord, would you take all of my life? Oh, they could pray something like this, whether they're watching online this morning or they're in this room. They could pray a prayer something like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I admit to you that I'm a sinner. I've missed the mark of perfection. Lord, I've broken your heart. I've sinned. But Lord, today I want to ask you to forgive me of all those sins, past, present, and future. And today I believe that you are the Savior of the world, that you love enough to come and live and die for me, to live a sinless life in a sin-filled, shaky world, to die for me because you love me, and to rise again to conquer death, hell, and the grave. So today I believe that, Lord, with my head and with my heart, so much that it changes my life. I confess you as my Savior. I cannot save myself. And I commit my life to you as Lord for the rest of my days. 
Oh, I pray if you pray that prayer, friend. When we get through our service in the building, you'll come and find one of our staff in the foyer and say, listen, I want to know how to find Jesus this morning. If you're watching online this morning, I pray that you would reach out to us by email or one of those private chats or ways you can reach out to us on social media and we'll, we'll contact you. We'll get in touch with you so that you can know more about what it means to follow Christ. For the rest of us this morning, continue with our heads bowed and our eyes closed this morning. The song will be for us. Lord, take it all. As the Lord would sit across from us and examine our lives, if it's authentic or not, that God would say, well, listen, there's some things that are still missing. We have some things we've hold on to. There's some things we've taken back from God that we need to give back to Him and say, Lord, I need to give you back these things in my life. And I want to be an authentic follower of Jesus that the evidence of my life would back up who I am in Christ Jesus so that I could live unshaken this week. Lord, may this be the prayer of every single person in this room Lord, that you would take it all Lord, our heart we give to you. It is yours. Lord, would you take it all this morning? Hear the cries of our heart. In Jesus' name.